The End of School Days I am John Ridd, a farmer of the village of Orr in Somerset, and I have a story to tell you. It is about some things that happened to me in my younger days. On the 29th of November, 1673, when I was twelve years old, John Fry, a worker from our family's farm, came to collect me from my school at Tiverton. He rode his horse up to the gate, leading my own little horse behind him. He was two weeks early, so I knew something was wrong. What are you doing here, John? I asked him. It's not the holidays yet. He would not look at me. Oh, I know that, young Master Ridd, but your mother has saved the best apples and cooked some wonderful cakes, all for you. And father? How is father? I said. It was usually father who came to collect me and it was strange that John Fry hadn't said anything about him. Oh, he's very busy on the farm just now, he said. But John wasn't his usual self, and I knew this was a lie. When I had packed my bags and said goodbye to my friends, I got on my horse and we started the journey home. It was a long journey from Tiverton to Orr, and in places the road was very bad. John Fry still would not tell me why he had come to collect me or answer my questions about father. He looked unhappy about something, but I tried to hope for the best, as boys always do. On the hill at the end of Dulverton town, we saw a big coach with six horses. In the front seat of the coach sat a foreign-looking woman, and next to her was a little dark-haired girl. I could see from the girl's soft skin that she was from a rich family, and I felt too shy to look at her more than once. She didn't look at me at all. Opposite them sat a very beautiful lady in fashionable clothes, and next to her was a little boy who was about two or three years old. The woman in the front, I thought, must be the servant of the family. I always remembered the family afterwards, because I had never seen people who were so grand and so rich. After Dulverton, the road got worse and worse, and soon we came into a very dangerous part of the country. This was Exmoor, a place of high, wild hills and deep valleys, and on Exmoor lived a family of robbers called the Dunes. Everyone was afraid of them. They had robbed and murdered on Exmoor for many years and had grown very strong. Now it was getting dark and a fog was coming down. It was just the kind of night when the Dunes would be out and we were coming near to the path that they always used. I wanted to ride fast and cross the dune path as quickly as possible, but John Fry knew better. Go slowly and quietly, he said, if you want to see your home again. But when we came to the valley where the dune path was, we heard the sound of horses. Hide, said John and we rode our horses off the path and hid. But I wanted to look at the dunes and went up onto a hill above the path. From there I saw a frightening sight. Below me, 
Moving quietly were thirty horsemen. They were heavy, strong men, like all the dunes, and they were dressed for battle, carrying guns. Tied to their horses were all the things they had stolen. Some had sheep or other animals, but one man had a child across his horse, a little girl. She had on a very expensive dress, and I thought it was probably for this that the dunes had stolen her. I could not see whether she was alive or dead, but the sight of that child made me sad and angry. When we got home to the farm, my father did not come out to meet us, not even when the dogs ran up and made a lot of noise. Perhaps he has visitors, I thought, and is too busy to come out. But really, I knew this was not true. I went away and hid. I didn't want anyone to tell me anything. I heard my mother and sister crying when they came out to find me, but I could not look at them. Later, they told me everything. My father had been killed. He had been murdered by the dunes. It happened on his way back from the market at Porlock on a Saturday evening. He was riding with six other farmers, and the dunes stopped them and asked them for their money. The other farmers passed their money over at once, but my father was brave. He rode at them, waving his long stick above his head. He managed to hit quite a few heads, but one dune was waiting at the side of the road with a gun and shot him. Although we knew it was the dunes who had killed my father, it was useless even to ask the local judges or law officers to do anything about it. They were afraid of the robbers too, or were even helping them. The dunes did almost anything they wanted on Exmoor. They were not local people. They came from the north of England, where their leader, Sir Ensor Dune, had been a rich man with a lot of land. But he argued with his cousin, the Earl of Lorne, who had even more land, and because of the trouble he caused, the king took away nearly everything that Sir Ensor owned. A proud, angry man, Sir Ensor, refused to make peace with his cousin, and without his land and farms, he became very poor. Then he found that people who had once been happy to know him now turned away from him. After this, Sir Ensor lived his life outside the law. With his wife and family and a few servants, he looked all over the country for a place to live where no one would know him and he could start again. He chose Exmoor, where few people live, and found the perfect place to build a new home. This was the place we now call Dune Valley. It is a green valley far from any town, surrounded by steep, rocky mountains. At first, Sir Ensor lived peacefully, and the local people were friendly, even bringing him presents of food. But as his sons grew older, they did not want to work as farmers, and they began to take whatever they needed from the local farms and villages. They carried off farmers' daughters to be their wives and give them sons, and so over the years the Doon family became bigger and bigger. They began as robbers, but robbery had quickly led to violence and murder. 
The people of Exmoor were too afraid to fight back, because the Dunes were big, strong men and excellent fighters, and now only soldiers could hope to break into their valley and defeat them. So there was no punishment for my father's murderer. We buried him quietly, and my mother was left without a husband to manage our farm and take care of her three children. We were too young to be of much help to her yet. I was the oldest, then there was Annie, two years younger than me, then little Lizzie. For a while I wanted revenge. I was strong and growing stronger every day. But my mother always calmed me down when I talked of revenge. She did not want to lose me, too, and I used to worry about what would happen to her and my sisters if I were killed. We tried to get on with our lives, but we missed my father terribly. Sometimes my mother and Annie would remember him and cry, and sometimes John Fry saw me with tears in my eyes which I said was because of the cold wind. Lizzie, though she was the cleverest of us all, was too young to really understand what had happened. So the months passed, I learnt how to shoot with my father's gun, and I worked hard on the farm to help my mother. Chapter 2 a boy and a girl. St. Valentine's Day, 1675, was the day that changed my life forever, though I did not know it then. I was fourteen. My mother had been ill and was not eating very well, so I went out to find something that she liked. Good, fresh fish caught from clear water. I went first along the Lynn River that runs through our valley. Then I turned into Bagworthy Water. Though I knew that this river led to Dune Valley, I did not think about it. I went on catching fish and moving up the river, then suddenly found myself standing at the bottom of the cliffs outside Dune Valley. In front of me was a waterfall, a steep hill of smooth, fast-moving water. It was a wild, lonely place, surrounded by tall trees, and it was already getting late. I knew I should turn for home but I also wanted very much to see what was at the top of that waterfall. It looked a dangerous climb, but if I did not climb it, I would always remember that I was too frightened to do it. So I climbed. The water beat against my legs, once knocking me down so that I nearly drowned but I pulled myself up and went on. When I reached the top at last, my arms and legs were aching and my feet were cut by the rocks. I fell in the grass, exhausted. When I opened my eyes, for a few seconds I didn't know where I was, but kneeling beside me, touching my face with a leaf, was a very young girl. Oh, I'm so glad, she whispered softly as I sat up and looked at her. Now you'll try to be better, won't you? I had never heard as sweet a sound as this girl's voice, nor seen anything as beautiful as the large dark eyes that watched me, full of care and wonder. 
I stared at her without speaking, noticing her long, shining black hair. What is your name? she said. And how did you get here? And what have you got in your bag? They're fish for my mother, I said. Very special fish. But I'll give you some, if you like. Dear me, you're so proud of them when they're only fish. But look at your feet. They're bleeding. Let me tie something round them for you. Oh, I'm not worried about them, I said bravely. My name's John Ridd. What's your name? Lorna Doon, she answered in a soft voice and looked down at the grass. She seemed afraid of her own name. Lorna Doon, didn't you know? I stood up and touched her hand and tried to make her look at me, but she turned away. I felt sorry for her and even more sorry when she started to cry. Don't cry, I said. I'm sure you've never done any harm. I'll give you all my fish, Lorna, and catch some more for my mother. But she looked so sad, with the tears running down her face, that my heart ached for her and I gave her a kiss. At once my face turned red. Here was I, just a simple farmer's boy. But she, though young, was clearly a lady and far above me. She turned her head away, and I felt I should go, but I couldn't. She turned back to look at me, you must go, she said. They will kill us if they find us together. You have found a way up into the valley which they could never believe. You must go now, but when your feet are better, you can come and tell me how they are. She smiled at me, and I could see that she liked me. We talked for a while longer, but then a shout came down the valley. Lorna's face changed from playfulness to fear. We whispered our goodbyes. Then Lorna ran away from me and lay in the grass, pretending to be asleep. I hid behind some rocks and saw twelve cruel-looking men come walking down the valley, looking for Lorna. One of them, the biggest of them all, a man with a long black beard, found her. Here she is, he said. Here's our little queen. He picked her up and kissed her so hard that I heard him. Then he put her on his shoulders and carried her away. But as she went up the valley on the back of this frightening man, Lorna turned and secretly held up her hand to me. Now I had to find a way out of the valley and get home. I almost broke my neck several times climbing down the mountain, and I did not get home until long after dark. My mother was angry with me, but I would not say where I had been. After my adventure, I thought a lot about the strange little girl I had met in Doon Valley, but I never really imagined I would go back to the valley again. So after a while, I thought less about her and got on with my work on the farm. Chapter 3 Back to Dune Valley 
The months and the years went by, and I grew very tall and strong, as my father had been. By the time I had finished growing, I was bigger than any man on Exmoor, and could pick up John Fry with one hand and hold him in the air until he begged me to put him down. My sister Annie grew more and more beautiful every year, with her wide blue eyes and soft brown hair. She was so kind and so gentle that everyone loved to be with her, and it is easy to understand why my mother's cousin, Tom Faggus, fell in love with her. Tom Faggus was someone that our family was both proud and ashamed of. For a time, he was one of the most famous robbers in England, and people still tell the stories of his adventures all over the country. He had been an honest farmer once, but a rich man had used the law to steal his farm, and after that Tom took his revenge on all rich men he met on the roads. Perhaps that was why he was so popular with the people, as he stole only from the rich, gave generously to the poor and the sick, and never hurt anyone in his life. While I was still a boy, he came to our farm one day, asking my mother for food and a bed for the night. At first, my mother told him to go away, fearing that we children would learn bad ways from him. But in the end, she agreed. You may be a bad man in some ways, she said to him, but there are far worse than you, so come and sit by the fire and eat whatever we can give you. Tom always had a smile and a good word for everybody, and was great fun to be with. All the time he was with us, I saw Annie looking at him very kindly, and over the years we had many more visits from him. As for Lizzie, I never thought anyone would fall in love with her. She was small and thin, and perhaps a little too clever. You never knew what she was going to say next. But I should not talk in this way about my own sister. My mother didn't seem to grow any older and was still pretty and as good-hearted as ever. She had never forgotten my father, and as the years went by, she still sometimes cried for him. In all this time, if I thought of Lorna Doon at all, it was only as a kind of dream, and the Doon men went on robbing and killing just as they pleased. Then. One Christmas, when I was twenty-one, my Uncle Ben was robbed by the Doones on his way across Exmoor. He had been coming to visit us, and when he didn't arrive, my mother sent me out to look for him. I found him on a high, lonely path, tied onto his horse with his nose to its tail. He was very angry and wanted revenge on the dunes. He asked me to show him where they lived, so that he could learn the best way to attack them when the time was right. So, a day or two later, I took him up into the mountains that looked down on the valley. I had not been back this way since I was fourteen, and on the way I thought of the girl I had met in this valley, of her lovely dark eyes, her sweet smile, her sadness, and her loneliness. At the top of a steep cliff, 
we looked down into the long green dune valley. At either end was a narrow gap in the mountain walls. At the further end was the waterfall which I had climbed seven years before, and at the other was what we called the Dune Gate. This was two rocky cliffs facing each other with only a narrow path between them. It was like the gate of a castle, and it seemed impossible to break into the valley. But Uncle Ben saw a way. Do you see how you could attack them? he said. If you put big guns along the cliffs on both sides and fired down into the valley, you could defeat the dunes in half an hour. But I was not listening to him. I was looking across to the waterfall end of the valley, and a little figure in white walking there, someone who walked with a very light step. My heart began to beat more quickly, and the blood came to my face. In seven years I had half forgotten her, and she would never remember me, I thought. But at that moment, once and for all, I saw my future in front of me, Lorna Doone. On the way home I was quiet, and Uncle Ben asked me many times what was wrong with me, but I could not tell him. The truth was, I had decided to go back into Doone Valley. I waited until St. Valentine's Day, the exact day when I had first entered the valley. Again, I followed the river, and again I climbed the waterfall. Although I was seven years older, the climb was not easy. When I got to the top, I looked around me carefully. In the early spring sunshine, the valley was beautiful. As I looked at the stream and the fields of grass on either side of it, I forgot about any dangers. And then I heard someone singing in a beautiful voice. At first I hid behind a rock, but when I looked out, I saw the lovely sight of Lorna Doone coming towards me, along by the side of the stream. Her beauty frightened me. How could I, only a farmer, talk to her? But something seemed to pull at me, and I came out from behind the rock. At first she turned to run away, not knowing who I was. But then I said, Lorna Doone, and she seemed to remember me. A smile broke out on her face. I'm John Ridd, I said, the boy who gave you those beautiful fish seven years ago today. Oh yes, the boy who was so frightened that he hid behind those rocks, I remember. And do you remember how kind you were, and how you wanted to help me? And then you went away, riding on a big man's shoulders, and pretending you had never seen me, but you looked back and waved at me. Oh yes, I remember everything, because it isn't often I see anybody, except, I mean, well, I just remember, that's all. But don't you remember, sir, how dangerous this place is? But I couldn't answer her. She had kept her eyes on me all the time, large eyes of a softness and brightness and beauty that took my breath away. I felt love taking hold of me, a love too deep 
and too strong for words. How could I explain feelings that I did not really understand myself? She turned her eyes away from me. I don't think you can possibly know, John Ridd, the dangers of this place or what its people are like. I could see that she herself was very frightened. She was trembling, from fear that someone might see me while I was there and hurt me. To tell the truth, I also grew afraid, and thought I had better go and say no more until the next time I came. I touched her white hand softly. Don't be afraid, I said. I'll go now, but I'll come again soon and bring you some fresh eggs from our farm. She reminded me again of the danger. But, she went on, it seems that you still remember your secret way in. And she smiled at me kindly. Chapter 4 Lorna's Story I went home with my head in the clouds and my heart on fire with love. All that week I could not stop thinking about Lorna, and I did my work on the farm in a dream. Soon I went to see her again. This time, when she saw me, she came quickly towards me. Mr. Ridd, are you mad? she said. There are men on guard all round the valley. We must hide at once. She took my hand and led me to her secret place, which was a kind of room hidden in the rock of the mountain. It was a green peaceful place, open to the sky above, but the only way into it was through a narrow entrance in a cave. I gave her the eggs I had brought her as a present, and at this she began to cry. What have I done? I asked. It's nothing you've done, she said. It's just a sadness that I feel when I see anything from the world outside, and you've been very kind, and I'm not used to kindness. I wanted to put my arms around her and kiss her, but I knew this would be wrong. So I sat and listened, and I think this made her like me more, because she began to tell me her life story. She told me everything, everything except what her feelings were towards John Ridd. Only two people ever listen to me or try to help me, she began. One is my grandfather, Sir Ensor Doon, and the other is my uncle, a clever man whom they call the Counselor. My grandfather is a very old and very hard man, except with me. He seems to know what is right and wrong, but not to want to think about it. And the counsellor smiles a lot and talks about what is right and good, but he never does a good thing himself. My Aunt Sabina used to take care of me, and she taught me very carefully. She was a good person, honest and kind, and when she died, it was like losing a mother. Now there is only one woman I can talk to, Gwenny, my servant. She is my closest friend. I don't remember my father, but they say he was the eldest son of Sir Ensor Doon, and the bravest and best of them all. They say, because of that, that I am their queen. 
I dream of a world outside this one, Mr. Ridd. A world of peace. This valley is green and beautiful, but all around me is violence and robbery and stupid behaviour. I can't come down to their level. I can't forget myself and live like them. And strange questions come to me that they can never answer. When I try to think about the past, about my early childhood, I can't remember anything. I want to know what I am and why I am in this place. I suppose you think that strange. Perhaps people who are happy and at peace don't need to ask questions like those. Here Lorna began to cry again. I could think of nothing to say, but I dried her eyes for her. Mr. Ridd, I am ashamed and angry at myself for talking so much like this. But you, who have a mother who loves you, and sisters, and a quiet home, can't tell how lonely it is to live as I do. I have this secret place to come to because I begged them for it. Only Grandfather and the Counselor come here, and sometimes Carver, the Counselor's son. No one in the valley is as strong or brave as him, but he is not like his father. He is rough and violent, always quick to be angry, and will listen to no opinion except his own. There is talk of him wanting to marry me, but I would rather die than marry Carver Doon. Now you see how unhappy I am here. I would escape and go anywhere, but I know it would hurt my grandfather. This was too much for Lorna, and she couldn't tell me any more. She broke down and cried. I talked to her gently and kindly until she began to worry again about the danger I was in. I said I would come back and see her again, but she made me promise not to come back for another month, so that I would not add to her problems with fears about me. During that time, we agreed that if she were in any danger, she would put a dark coat over a white rock near her secret room. I would be able to see this from a hill above the valley, and then I would come. Chapter 5 To London But I was not able to see Lorna again as soon as I had hoped. Before the month had passed, I was called away from home in a very strange and unexpected way. One afternoon, as I was outside the house, feeding the horses, a stranger rode up to our gate and shouted at me. He was a tough-looking, hard-faced man, about forty years old, with small, quick eyes, and he was dressed very differently from the way we dress in Exmoor. He said he was looking for Plover's Barrows Farm and a man called John Ridd. When I told him he had found them both, he introduced himself as Jeremy Stickles, a servant of the king, and he gave me a letter. I looked at him in alarm, but he said there was nothing in the letter to worry me. At the top of the letter, my name was written in large letters. I read, To John Ridd. This letter is to order you to appear before the King's judges in London 
and tell them anything you know about some matters which may be harmful to the king and the country. Jeremy Stickles seemed very pleased by my fear and surprise at the letter, but he said again that no one was going to hurt me. All I had to do was tell the truth. When my mother read the letter, she became very worried and began to cry. She wondered how the king had heard of me and what he wanted to do with me. But Mr. Stickles, who wasn't really as hard as he seemed, explained everything carefully to her. He told her that the king only knew of me because the stories of my great size and strength had reached even London. He had heard I was a good man and thought I could help him, that was all. This made my mother feel better, but I was very unhappy. I was thinking of Lorna. How could I tell her I was going away? I had promised not to go back to the valley for a month, and that was still a few days away. But how terrible it would be if she came to look for me at the end of the month and I was not there. I would have to break my promise and go before the agreed time. Mr. Stickles was happy to stay at the farm for one or two days to try our good Exmoor food, so I used the time to look for Lorna. But I saw nothing of her in the valley and no signal that she needed me. There was nothing else I could do. Mr. Stickles wanted to go, and I had to leave for London without seeing her. A journey to London was both long and dangerous in those days because of all the robbers on the roads. As I said goodbye to my mother and sisters and took my last look at the farmhouse, I felt very miserable. But Jeremy Stickles was a good companion. As we rode, he told me many amusing stories of London life, and we became the best of friends. I did not like London. It was a crowded, dirty place, not at all like Exmoor, and, even worse, I had to wait more than two months before the king's judges were ready to see me. There was a lot of trouble in London at that time, with arguments between the king and the city of London. Nobody had time to talk to John Ridd, but I was not allowed to leave and go home. At last I was called to see Judge Jeffreys. Jeremy Stickles had told me about Judge Jeffreys. He was the king's chief judge, and there were terrible stories about him. He became very angry if anyone argued with him, and he had sent many of the king's enemies to their deaths. In the room I walked into, there were three men sitting on high seats, and they were dressed in very rich clothes. In front of each of them was a desk with pen and paper. The man in the middle seemed to be the most important. He was a big, heavy man with a square chin and a kind of fire in his eyes. He was a man that almost anyone would be afraid of. This was certainly Judge Jeffreys. He gave me a terrible stare and asked me who I was and where I came from. When I had told him, he said, Well done, John Ridd. You have answered me without fear. 
I remember this matter now. I will ask you some questions. He looked at me more closely. In Exmoor, he said, there is a family of robbers. Is that true? I told him it was. And why isn't your local judge doing anything about them? I suppose he's afraid, my lord. The robbers are very strong, and their valley is hard to attack. But they must still answer to the law, Judge Jeffreys said. What's the name of these people, and how many of them are there? They are the Dunes, and we think there are about forty men in the valley. I will do something about these thieves, he said. Perhaps I will come down to the west myself. But then he stared hard at me again and asked, Is there any sign in Exmoor of any dislike of the king? No, my lord. We don't know much about him. That's a good answer, <laughs> he laughed. But the king knows he has enemies in the country. I see you know nothing about them, though. You're a good man, John Ridd. Keep out of trouble. Keep away from the king's enemies, and from the dunes as well, and you will be safe. I was going to use you as a spy, but I see you're too honest. I will send someone else, but never tell anyone what I've said to you. Here he stared at me very angrily, but when he saw he had frightened me enough, he smiled again. Now go home, John. I will remember you and I don't think you will forget me. I had no money left to hire a horse for the journey back to Exmoor, so I had to walk the whole way. It took me seven days, and I was very glad to get home again. Chapter 6 Lorna's New Troubles When I arrived at the farm, Mother held me tightly and cried for half an hour. I gave everyone all the presents I had bought for them in London, but of course what I wanted to do most of all was find Lorna and see how she was. I wanted to tell mother all about her, but the thought of my father's murder by the dunes stopped me. There was little chance that Lorna would love me, so why should I worry my mother about it? As soon as I could, I went to Dune Valley, but there I could not believe my bad luck. When I looked from the cliff top, I saw Lorna's sign, her coat on a white rock. She had needed me, and now perhaps I was too late to help her. I climbed round the outer cliffs to the waterfall, and was soon looking down towards the green fields of the valley. I stood and waited not caring now if anyone saw me. And then, at last, a little figure came towards me. I could see she was frightened, so I went towards her slowly. Miss Lorner, I saw your sign on the white rock that you needed me. Oh yes, but that was a long time ago. Two months or more, sir. And she looked away. She looked so sad that I thought everything was over between us and tried to turn away and go. But when she saw that I was hurt and ashamed, she ran towards me, 
and took my hands. Oh, John, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you, she said. How happy I was to hear her call me John. Then she led me away to her secret room, through the cave in the mountain. Since it was partly open to the sky, plants and flowers were able to grow there, and now, in the late summer, it was beautiful. She could not look at me at first, but when she did, I could see that she had been crying. My grandfather is not well, she said, and now Carver Doon and his evil father, the Counselor, have more control over the Doones. They want me to marry Carver. Not immediately, I am only seventeen, but they want me to give my promise in front of my grandfather that I will marry Carver. They say it's for the peace of the Doones. That's why I left the signal out for you, Mr. Ridd. They wanted to force me, but my grandfather would not let them. They won't do it, at least while grandfather is alive. But they're watching me and following me, and I can't go where I want any more. Gwenny is helping me. If she wasn't, I couldn't even be here talking to you. But perhaps even you don't care about me any more. Her eyes filled with tears, and I quickly explained about my journey to London. I told her how much I had missed her, and how I had worried about her all this time. Then I showed her the present I had brought her from London, a ring with blue and white stones. At first she cried even more, and then came and sat so close to me that I began to tremble. Then I picked up her hand, and while I was pretending to look at its beauty and softness, put the ring on her finger. Oh, Mr. Ridd, she said, her face going red. I thought you were much too honest and simple ever to do something like this. No wonder you are good at catching fish. But no, John, you have not caught me yet, not completely, though I like you very much. And if you will only keep away, out of danger, I will like you even more. With tears still in her eyes, which seemed to come partly from wanting to love me as much as I loved her, she kissed my head. Then she gently took my ring off her finger, and kissing it three times, gave it back to me. John, I cannot take it now, she said. It would not be right. I will try to love you dearly as dearly as you could wish. Keep the ring for me until then. Something tells me I will earn it very soon. This time I promised Lorna that I would not come back to see her for two months. If Carver or the counsellor became violent towards her, she would signal me as before. Two months was a long time to wait, but because of what she had said to me, I was happy. Very soon after that, I told my sister Annie about Lorna. I knew she would keep my secret, and it was good to be able to talk to her about my troubles. Then she gave me a surprise. Tom Faggus had asked her to marry him, and she had agreed. But although Mother liked Tom, we both knew she would not like her daughter to marry him. And how would she feel about me wanting to marry Lorna Doone? 
we promised to help each other if we could. On the very first day after the agreed two months, I went to find Lorna. But this time, when I got to the top of the waterfall, she was not there. I waited for hours, but she didn't come. Then I saw something that made me afraid for her. While I was hiding behind a tree, a big man appeared, walking lazily down the valley. He wore a wide hat, a dark jacket, and tall boots, and he carried a gun over his shoulder. As he came closer, I could see his face clearly, and there was something in it that turned me cold with a kind of horror. It was a face that never smiled, and in his eyes was only cruelty. I did not doubt that this was Carver Doon. And this was the man, I thought angrily, who planned to marry Lorna. He had no idea I was there, but I almost hoped he would discover me. If we could fight hand to hand, a fight between us would be fair, as he was the only man I knew who was near my size. But I knew it would be a mistake to fight Carver. Whether I won or lost, the Dooms would learn about me, and I would never see Lorna again. When by the evening Lorna had still not appeared, I went home. I went back to the valley every day for two weeks, but never saw Lorna. I saw Carver Dune again, though, walking with his gun round the top of the valley, and that worried me. I was sure that Lorna was in danger. I would go into Dune Valley and find her. This time, I decided to go by the Dune Gate. It was a dangerous route, but I knew it would be useful to know how the Dunes defended the main entrance to their valley. At night, the Dune Gate, with its tall black cliffs and sharp rocks, was a frightening place. There were no guards outside, and very quietly and carefully, I entered the narrow, dark path between the cliffs. Soon I saw a light shining round a corner of the cliff, and staying close to the rock wall, I stepped carefully up to the corner and looked round it. Two guards were sitting by the light with their guns on the ground beside them. Here, the cliffs widened out into broken, rocky ground with deep shadows between the rocks. The guards were clearly not expecting an attack and were drinking and talking. I stood and watched, and while I was wondering what to do, they began to argue and then to fight. This gave me my chance. I went slowly along the cliff wall, and then moved quickly into the shadows of the open rocky ground. The guards were so busy with their fight that they did not see or hear me, and I was soon past them and going down the hillside into Dune Valley. Lorna had told me that her grandfather's house was the first one after the gate. So, carefully and quietly, I went towards it and stood below one of the windows. I could not shout or call out because there were other guards around the small village. But luck was with me that night. Lorna came to the window, opened it, and looked out up at the night sky. I whispered her name. She jumped in alarm, but then looked down and saw who I was. John, 
she said. Oh, John, you must be mad. I was going mad because I didn't know what had happened to you. But you knew I would come. I hoped you would. But do you see, they have put these bars across my window. She put her hand out through them, and I took it and kissed it, and then held both her hands in mine. Oh, John, you'll make me cry, she said, though I could see she had already been crying. We can never be together. Why should I make you unhappy? Try to forget me. Never, I said. If we want to belong to one another, Lorna, no one can stop us. Only God, if he wishes it. Now, tell me, why have you been kept in prison here? My grandfather is very ill now. I am afraid he won't live long. The counsellor and his son are the masters of the valley. They want me here where they can see me, so that I can't escape from Carver. And Gwenny is not allowed to move about now, so I couldn't send you a message or signal you. You must watch this house day and night, John, if you wish to save me. There is nothing they wouldn't do if my poor grandfather... Oh... I can't think only of myself, when I should think of him. How can I leave you even one more night here, Lorna? I said. You must, John, she said. You're so brave, but I love you too much to let you stay any longer. Yes, it's true, but I cannot leave my grandfather while he is dying. So if you love me, John, you must go. I'll go for now, but when I hear that your grandfather has died, I will come and get you out of here. If I promise to take you safely away, will you come with me? Yes, she said. Of course I will. So now I took her hand in mine again and put my ring on her finger. I had kept it in my pocket since the day I had first brought it to her. This time she kept it, though she cried and held my hand tightly. Oh, John, this can never, never be, she said. Chapter 7 Lorna Leaves the Valley I left Doon Valley by my own secret route and went home to make plans for bringing Lorna to the farm. It was time to tell Mother all about Lorna and the danger she was in. At first, Mother was very angry and unhappy at my news. She talked wildly about going away and leaving the farm, but after a time she began to calm down. When you see her, mother, I said, I'm sure you will love her like a daughter, and I know she will love you with all her heart. She is so good and gentle. Mother was too kind-hearted to be angry for long. She cried a little more, then smiled and said, Well, God knows what is good for us. You must bring her here, John, and I will teach her how to be a farmer's wife. Lorna and I had agreed a new signal. There was a tall tree near her grandfather's house which I could see from the cliff-top above the valley. In the top branches of the tree there were seven large birds' nests from the last summer. 
Gwenny could climb like a cat, and if one morning I saw only six nests, then Lorna's grandfather was dead, and she was in great danger. It was a bad winter that year. We had more snow than anyone could remember, and on Exmoor the snow was soon so deep that no one could walk on it safely. I had to find a way to cross this, but I had an idea. Lizzie had once shown me a book about the icy countries of the far north, where people wore snowshoes. The book had pictures of these wide, flat shoes, which stopped travellers' feet going down through the snow. For the first time I thanked my sister in my heart for reading so many books. I found some wood and animal skins, and soon I had made some snowshoes, like the ones in Lizzie's book. We had a sled on the farm, which we used when the ground was covered in ice. A horse could not pull it in this weather, but with my snowshoes, I could. I could use it to carry Lorna and her servant. Some days later, I saw only six birds' nests in the tree, and that evening I tied myself to the sled and left for Dune Valley. I took the sled to the waterfall, which was now a fall of ice, and tied it up there. Then I continued on foot, going around the south side of the valley towards the dune gate. But when I looked down, I saw there was a quicker way to reach Lorna. The sides of the valley, like everything else, were covered in deep snow, and here the snow was smooth and icy. I looked around to check that there were no dunes in sight then sat down on the icy snow and pushed myself off. In seconds I had slid all the way down the mountainside and landed in a hill of soft snow at the bottom. At Sir Ensor's house I whispered Lorna's name below the window as before. This time Gwenny let me in when she was sure who I was. But inside I saw a terrible sight. Gwenny looked almost mad with hunger, and Lorna lay back on a chair as white as the valley all around us. Good God, I said, and ran to her. I took her in my arms, but she was so weak that she could not speak at first. We've been kept in here for days without food, said Gwenny, and they were going to keep us here until Lorna agreed to marry Carver. We must leave at once, I said. Will you come with me, Lorna? I promise to take you safely through the snow. Lorna gave me her lovely smile. Of course I will, dear, she whispered. Of course I will. And you too, of course, Gwenny, I said. Be quick now and help me to get your mistress ready. From outside I had heard the sounds of singing. There were usually guards around the house. Gwenny told me, but tonight the Dunes were drinking and dancing to welcome Carver as their new leader. This would give us our chance. With all this happening, the robbers would never notice us leaving. We were soon ready. I picked up my beautiful Lorna and carried her through the snow and the darkness to the other end of the valley. Gwenny was able to follow us, 
putting her feet in the places where my snowshoes had been. I made Lorna comfortable in the sled, with her little servant beside her, and I told her to hold on to Lorna tightly. The waterfall was now a path of ice, very steep and dangerous, but I was able to take the sled down it, using my stick and all my strength to stop it going too fast on the ice. When we were down the waterfall, I tied myself to the sled and began to pull. It was hard work for me, but the best work I had ever done in my life. There was no time to lose with Lorna so weak from hunger and cold, so I pulled fast, and an hour later we were home. My mother and sisters came to the door and helped me to carry Lorna in. We put her in a chair by the fire and gave her some soup. Then she slept while I watched over her. After a time, she began to wake up. She put her trembling hands into mine and looked at me with so much love in her eyes that I could not find the words to speak to her. We sat like this for several minutes, and then we heard a little sound behind us. It was Mother, crying with happiness to see us so loving. At this, Lorna got up and went to her. She knelt beside Mother's chair and looked up into her face. Mother put her hand on Lorna's hair. My sweet child, she said softly. A few days later, when Lorna and I were sitting together by the fire, she said to me, John, you gave me a beautiful ring, and now I want to give you something. It is only a very poor old thing but it's all I have. My grandfather gave it to me before he died. I hope you will take it. Then she put on my finger the strangest ring I had ever seen. It was very old, and there was a picture on it. It was hard to see what the picture was, but it looked almost like a cat in a tree. I shall wear it, my love, I said, until the day I die.